Welcome to the Jolly Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Barrett. This podcast is for those who are interested in the conversation around equity, diversity, and inclusion. Each week, I'll be interviewing a guest who has something special to share or is actively part of building solutions in the space. Let's get started. Dr. Ruth Backstrom is a trained coach in the dynamic facilitation technique, a method designed to help people address and solve impossible seeming issues by working together collaboratively to achieve shifts and breakthroughs for large communities and entire systems of society. Previously, she spent 10 years working as a community advocate for more sustainability and a champion for creating a food policy council. She holds degrees from the University of Iowa and Columbia University. Her first book called Igniting a Bold New Democracy, Empowering Citizens Through Game-Changing Reforms, just released in March 2023. So what if instead of fighting over politics, diverse groups of citizens came together to envision and create the kind of system we want? Is that even possible? So I am thrilled to have Dr. Ruth Backstrom here with me this week. Um, She is an author, speaker, and acclaimed educator. Um, And I love the fact that you're an expert in facilitation methods that foster deeper conversations, um, because we all know we could use deeper conversations. Um, Yes, that's for sure. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm so excited. I, I'm really excited about your new book, um, you know, Ig- Igniting a Bold New Democracy and Empowering Citizens Through Game-Changing Reforms. And it's a beautiful cover. So for those of you Thank not you. able to see it, go to Amazon and check it out. Um, get the book. And, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what some of your thoughts are so that we can actually ignite a bold new democracy. And what does that even mean? So thank you. So thank you for being here. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Melissa. Yes, yes. So so tell me a little bit about what let's just start with tell me a little bit about how you got here and how you even, you know, figured out like I need to write this book on igniting a new democracy a bold yeah, democracy yeah so this comes back to a long um yearning of mine when I was a, a young child I went through a low wealth african american community and I said to my mother like how come these communities are so you know have so much less wealth I, I mean I didn't use that phrase as a 7 year old because I was 7 <laughs> but I was still something like that you know and she didn't give me an answer that I found really satisfying. You know, I mean, as a kid, there's the innocence of kids. It's often the truth, the deeper truth of things. And I remember thinking, you sh- we should be sharing things more. Like, that's what all the adults tell us to do. <laughs> and why aren't the adults <laughs> doing this, you know? Now, so, where did you grow up? I grew up in Chicago, the south side Chicago. of Chicago. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so then um, five years later, I was listening on the radio and I heard this voice, this deep resonant voice. And I thought, this is a man who's addressing my concerns and he's speaking from a place that most people don't even visit. You know, I, I just felt that as a kid is strong. And I was 13. And at that time I was going to a school that was like 90% African-American. And so I knew the problems. It was overcrowded. It had twice the capacity of student the students that it should have had. So they had like an up staircase and a down staircase to handle the flow. It was just a mess. It was hard to imagine learning under those circumstances. And then they had these mobile units in the back. So when I found out there was a protest um, about integrating schools, because this was not very integrated, obviously, then I went and decided I was going to join. And so I got on the IC with my best friend and we went downtown. And we got to the spot where all the marchers were convening and they'd called the superintendent, Benjamin Willis, and said, you know, we're going to come and speak to you. And he said he wasn't interested in speaking to us. No surprise, right? (laughs) (laughs) 
So then it was decided that we would sit down. And so I started to sit down and then out of the side of my eye, I noticed that our organizer, who was Dick Greg- Gregory, who was a comedian at the time. Yes. Um, yeah, really famous comedian. Uh-huh. And they were beating him and there was like blood coming down his face. And as a 13 year old, this was like shocking to me because I'd never seen a scalp wound before. And you know how blood is just pours out when you have these scalp wounds. And so I was really terrified, you know. And so I said to my friend, hold on tight. And this policeman saw me and he said, I'll get that one. And I was like, oh, no. And, and thought, pointing to you? Yes. Oh. He, he took my comment as like, a you know, an aggressive uh, remark. And he was going to make a point and make an example out of me. At which point I like said, I'm walking into the paddy wagons <laughs> and I st- walked into the paddy wagons. But it leaves me with the feeling of how courageous that whole movement was and the things that people were up against and the desire to finish it, to really have a full, you know, fully developed, integrated, equitable society. Yeah. Well, no doubt. And I'm sure your mother didn't appreciate you going to jail that early in life. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my mother, fortunately, was very liberal. And she was like, I knew something like this would happen. <laughs> you know, this is just kind of, what's to come for. Uh, this is just the beginning, right? That's right. For my God. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's that awesome. was yeah, that was the beginning of my interest in having, you know, really more societies. And one of the things that I look at in my book is what happened? Why didn't we make more progress on these things? And how can we now? How can we have conversations that take us to this place of our shared humanity and our shared goals and aspiration? Yes. So, And how how can we? I mean, that's that's kind of the, the question. So, that's right. I mean, can you talk a little bit about when you talk about, and I don't know whether to start with, you know, kind of your facilitation technique or or how, you know, what is a bold new democracy and how do we even get to one? Yeah. So what I imagine is the bold new democracy is one we create through a civic agenda. We, we get together and we say, these are the, the changes that we really need. And we know these changes. We've talked about them for decades. We know the changes that we need. So we just have to take our power back. You know, we have to come together and say, this is what we've reached consensus on. Just start with what we agree on, like money out of politics. Everybody agrees on that. But we need to take power back and do it and start locally. Like Maine actually is a great example of that. They had like... They were funding 80% of their elections with local funds for the state. And they had the most progressive agenda as a result of that. So we know what happens if we could take it back and put the voice of the people into democracy. And so, and that's not just a, you know, that's not just a, a wild idea. That's actually happening all across the country, all across the world, in fact, from Washington state to Australia, there are citizen assemblies that are convening around climate change. And people are pushing the politicians to take much more radical measures because they can once the people say, you have to do this. It gives them the political cover to do those things. And so let me give you a story to illustrate that. Um, In Austria, they were looking at the issue of immigration. And so they convened what was called a citizen's council and that's it was a random selection of people and they got together and they were talking about the issue and at first they were shocked by the numbers because they said you know you have to be a little more transparent about how many people are coming over and stuff and then they somebody said but we have to see the people behind the numbers which kind of stirred everybody's compassion yeah and so then they said well what we should do is we should get them jobs But then this one guy said, well, I don't think we should get them jobs. And with dynamic facilitation, you it's a safe space so people can say anything. And the facilitator goes deeper to understand why that person is saying that. So the facilitator said, well, why do you say that? He said, well, I have a niece who's been looking for a job who can't get a job. So why should these people get jobs when she can't get one who can't get a job? So why should these people get jobs when she can't get one? 
Mm-hmm. And and that made him human. You know, that humanized him. And you saw where his concerns were coming from. And so then the group said, well, let's include her, too. Let's include anybody who needs a job in these job fairs. And that's what they did in the end. They created job fairs around the around the state, and they invited anyone to come. And that's an illustration of how groups can work really effectively. I like to talk about groups working from the level of their collective intelligence. Yes. We talk about individuals doing that, but groups can have that effect too. Like we talk about individuals being in the zone. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that groups too can work really powerfully together. Listen, you come into a group and you want to maybe punt for your idea to be the one that everybody gets behind. But as you talk, you can actually get to a place where you're thinking like a group about solving all the concerns and interests of everyone in the group. And that's what happens right. with the use of dynamic facilitation. Well, and I love that because I remember, I mean, I remember a time when we used to be able to take you know, one plus one equaled three, right? You really created synergy out of the information that, you know, one person would say over here versus another person would say over here. And it wouldn't be like, I have to go left or right. It would be, let's create a new path, right? Right. Um, You know, by bringing the ideas together, you actually made an even better idea. And now it seems like, no, it's left or right. That's it. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's We're going the wrong way on this stuff. And we have to realize that our city, it's not a liability. It's our greatest asset. Yes. Problem solving. More ideas that come into the room, the better. So we, we really need that. And we're now, we've done enough research about groups. So we actually know what are the conditions that create collective intelligence that allow it to kind of arise from the group. There's a really interesting book by a woman named Judith Glazier called Conversation, Conversational Intelligence. So she took these methods into the workplace. Mm-hmm. And it was really interesting. So she gave people the safety to say whatever they wanted to say, whatever they needed to say about a situation. And they also began to map their different realities together to get a shared reality of what was going on in the company. And she found if she could get to this deeper level of conversation, she called it a level three conversation, where everyone's open to the ideas and they're thinking together as a group. She could change the entire culture of the organization. I love it. And she, yeah, she took Clairol, for instance, at a time when you know natural hair dyes were coming out and they were not doing as well as they'd like. And they were at like 250 million. And she started this conversation and they went up into the billions over less than a decade. And wow. so it shows, I know it's a great concrete example of the change you create working for this more profound level of conversation. I love it. Well, and and so when you talk about uh, that conversation, one of the things that I was going to ask you is, you know, I mean, how do we actually begin the process of, you know, communicating with those that we disagree with? Because you were talking about, you know, I mean, it's a safe space. So we want to be able to express themselves. People can say whatever they want. But I find when people say whatever they want, then there's usually some sort of reaction that kind of takes things in a different direction altogether. Right. And and that's where the facilitator really has to work with the group and let that person's um, deeper humanity sort of become revealed, as, as that example showed. You know, y- at first you think of him as, as, you know, being unkind and not very empathetic, but you realize it's coming from this own place of, like, lack. You know, his, his niece was not getting a job. And I think that is often the case in our country as well. You know, there's a resentment that, well, we're, these immigrants are going to get things that we didn't get. And so that brings up a really important point. We need to treat our citizens better, too. You know, our citizens shouldn't feel so neglected. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, so that comes into the mix as well, you know. Okay, so we're going to address the needs of the citizens, but how do we address the needs, I mean, the needs of the immigrants? But we need to address the needs of the citizens as well. Yeah. And so it, it widens the prescription of what needs to be done. So you're really dealing with 
you know, a deeper level that includes more issues. So, I mean, how do people get started with, because, you know, I was telling you a little bit about, you know, I mean, I went, I've been to the, our city council meetings and they are not a place that I enjoy going, unfortunately, right. but, but I also know there is a necessity to show up because the local politics you know, in many cases have become even more important than some of the the national and federal level um, politics um, because you can actually drive and impact change in your community. But how do you actually get started? I mean, we have situations yeah. where they're, you know, it's like they're voting in blocks. Like, nope, the three of us, we always vote the same. And if it's a no, it's a no. Or the two of us, we always vote the same, you know, so how do we get started in actually yeah. changing that? Yeah, so I think the, the place to start is to, to see if you can get them receptive to listening to the voice of the people. You know, that's, that is the trick. And I think what happened in Austria, the way this got started was he started in little, you know, rural places to kind of refine the technique and get it. Get, get it smooth and then it started as it got smoother and smoother he also took it everywhere but the trick i think is to start with the citizens mm -hmm. you know bring citizens together and create a civ civic council i actually have a friend in california i can connect you with who's using dynamic facilitation to do work so <laughs> this would be a great place to start i know i know <laughs> and california is one of the few places that where there's actually a train trained a dynamic facilitator, but I, that is one of the things I want to do is I want to bring together the training and train more people in dynamic facilitation so we can have people practicing that, you know, across the country. And another technique that's really powerful that I mentioned in my book is appreciative inquiry, which has also been really successful at creating visions. So Healthy you said people. appreciative inquiry. Yeah, appreciative inquiry is what it's okay. called, right? So tell us more about what that means. Well, so it means starting with what's working. Okay. Building on that. But it also uh it's also been used very effectively in organizational development for like 30 years. So it has a great track record at being really successful. Both these techniques have a really good track record at being really successful. I and love and it. yeah, and uh and there's a lot of practitioners out there too who would love to uh take these increase these conversations so that they're deeper and that's the other thing that they really strive to do is create this deeper conversation that really focuses on what's working and how can we grow what's working and right. how can we always think about working from that positive angle to put more positivity to, into a situation so yes. you know there are a lot of a lot of really interesting things going on using facilitation to bring new perspectives into the world. So are there lessons that we could learn from the past that um, have been used before? Or is when you talk about the bold new democracy, I mean, are there new things that we, I mean, aside from dynamic facilitation, which I think is really kind of getting to the level of humanity. Right. Right. Um, where can we go from there? What can we learn from in the past that might resurrect? Yes. I mean, my first chapter, I start out talking about the GI Bill of Rights mm -hmm. and what a transformative thing that was and what an important legacy that is. We were the first ones to do that. It was this huge sociological experiment. You know, before that, nobody could, most people couldn't afford to go to college. They couldn't afford to own a home. And that people just paid off in space for every dollar we invested, we got a $7 return. And that's something we really, that should be part of our heritage that we remember. We need to invest in people. And yeah. we've sort of forgotten that. Uh, but we're starting, it's starting to come out. There's this movement, for instance, to invest in, um, to give homeless people a universal basic in income. In fact, they're doing that in Stockton, California. Mm -hmm. They're giving them five hundred dollars they found with five hundred dollars 35 percent can have attain housing i mean you can make a really big difference and yeah. that's the kind of investing we need to do again yeah and 
I think it's awesome that you just mentioned Stockton, California. How cool is that? (laughs) I know. I know. It's right there in your backyard. And another thing we should do is celebrate these things. As citizens, we need to go down there and say, we're so glad you're doing this. Instead of always being in this adversarial position, we need to actually take the initiative and say, we like the fact that you're doing this. We'd like to see you do this here and here and here, too. Right. and, and really, this is about taking our power back in a way, seeing ourselves as the really important um, leaders in these things. We, we've yeah. sort of given up our power. There's this ex- expectation like that you'll write checks and send it to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, whatever party you want, you want to win. But that's not really the most effective kind of engagement. We need to get in there and really have high level civic engagement. So, for instance, in Ireland, they've been having these civic assemblies for so long, and they're so popular that now if they're having a debate, they call forth a citizen assembly. But before you go there, so the question is, because when you go to some of these forums, they're not the civic ones you're talking about. They're not. Oh, no. no. (laughs) So, So how are they bringing in these civic assemblies When there is so much, you know, kind of strife, um, you know, and debate about things, is it, is it, do they go there and then they say, you know what, we're not going to resolve this today. So let's, you know, put it into a civic assembly or how does that process work? The rule is there has to be 80% agreement often. That's what they did in Poland, actually. They did a citizen assembly and they had to have 80%, any, before they even did it. The rule was if 80% of the people agree on it, you have to enact it. And oh, so that wow. was kind of, a, kind of an agreement that was brokered from the very beginning. And it was around floods. They've had, they had some floods and they weren't well prepared. And so these citizens met together to um, decide what they should do. And they came up with a number of recommendations, which they implemented. And they were much more successful in handling the next flood as a result. So, so, that's one way you can do it. And the other thing is they also asked that everybody justify whatever they were proposing. So there was the rationality of what they were doing was made aware, you know, they were made aware of it and stuff. Yeah. And there's something that happens in groups that's really kind of amazing in that you can get this energy in the group so people feel free to like change their minds. There's a kind of freedom there that you don't feel when when you you don't think you have to defend your identity. I mean, this is the, what happens in the city councils and why in some ways it's not as effective a venue because people get into this sort of identity and they're stuck in this identity. But for instance, there was one um, citizen assembly in rural Minnesota around climate change. And she said, you know, if you're given the right information, you could change your mind. <laughs> yes, yes. And you don't feel bad about it, right? Because it's yeah. like, oh, it's- you make the best decision using the information you have at the time. (laughs) That's right. That's right. (laughs) Let's pause for a moment. We'll be right back. One of my favorite examples actually is called um, a study that Stanford did called America in One Room. And they took 500 people in Dallas, Texas, and it was supposed to be representative of America in the proportions, you know, that you'd see in the regular population. And it was just a weekend. They polled them as they came in on how they felt on a number of different issues and how they felt about the state of democracy. And then over the weekend, they met with experts on five different topics, and they polled them again at the end. At the beginning, only 30% of the people thought democracy was doing moderately well. At the end of the weekend, 60% said democracy was doing reasonably well. And that is just a weekend. Uh, Yeah. It's it's a really powerful illustration of how just talking to each other is really powerful. And the other thing they found is everybody went towards the middle. You know, as they heard each other's arguments, they became less extreme in their points of view, too, which is something I hear a lot when I talk about my book is people say, you know, I really don't want the extremes talking as much. I want to hear more from the middle and stuff. Right, right. We have to go quickly. We can't negotiate with Mother Nature. She's not going to negotiate, you know, but we can negotiate with each other on other things. You know? 
Yeah, we, you know, the African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And, you know, it's one of those things where we, you know, we really don't realize the power of that collective. But I think it's challenging to get to the collective now. I mean, it's like people are, you know, in their homes on Zoom. Um, They're not necessarily in the same room in some cases, or sometimes they are. I mean, there's really kind of this whole hybrid interaction um, right. that we're, you know, so it, it becomes challenging, I think, just technically um, to get people organized in the same fashion um, just to have that conversation, especially if you've got a face-to-face version and a Zoom version, which a lot of, you know, city council meetings and, and such have now. Right. Um, But you're not really able to connect some of those dots sometimes as well as you'd like if you, you know, as if you were in person. Right. Right. Actually, they have developed a uh, dynamic facilitation method on on Zoom. So that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, So um, that's been used. Awesome. And they had to use it. And they actually did these citizen assemblies that way, too. Uh, And the interesting thing is that once people get a taste of these things, they love it. Really revitalizing democracies everywhere. For instance, they did one in Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia, on the deficits. They opened their books to the people and said, can you help us get rid of our deficits? I mean, can you imagine any city in the United States doing it? No, no, I can't. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, right. <laughs> anyway, the people got so excited because they felt like they changed from just being consumers to actually being real active citizens. Right. Stuff. This one woman calling from the delivery room saying, I wanted these points to get in. <laughs> <laughs> and another guy who was supposed to go on vacation canceled his vacation because he was so excited to be part of this process. Oh, wow. Well, and I think, you know, Yeah, it goes to that empowerment, right? You just shift the student becomes the teacher in a way, or, you know, you just shift your total perspective. And now it's like, okay, well, what do you want? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. That's fantastic. So then are there some examples of, you know, organizations are, I mean, do you think they're, you know, we have a lot of nonprofits that are popping up. Are there organizations that can take a a more significant role than maybe they've had in the past when it comes to politics and and citizen assemblies or Yeah, there are. Braver Angels is probably the best known organization working in this space. Um they have chapters all across the country and they bring um liberals and conservatives together to have debates and to have you know workshops and they're really working, they're having a lot of success and they have conventions that they bring together. So yeah, there's a lot going on in this space, actually. Oh, that's there's also a co-intelligence uh, institute that's really working with these citizen assemblies. So there's, yeah, there's a lot going on, a lot going on. When we think about the organizations, I know you also talked a lot about women getting involved. Yes, yes. I mean, why do you think that's so important in reshaping democracy, getting women more involved? Well, because I think that women have a lot of emotional intelligence and that's what's really needed. That's the learning. One of the chapters in my book, I talk about how we have to become a learning society. Mm -hmm. And we have to, I mean, there's so much change that has to go on. And I think women have a really good sense of how to balance things and to bring in their, their sort of innate knowledge of, this sort of realm. Yeah. And and it's then that's validated by research that shows a lot of the women governors did really well with the COVID stuff because they could encourage people and at the same time be sympathetic with how they were feeling. And it, it's that kind of balancing that I think is really important, you know? Yes. I, I think this is really an important time for women. Also, I think they have to they have to call back their own power too. I mean, yeah. it's kind of amazing that you know, some of the laws that have been passed that are really limiting much and stuff. So there's many reasons for women to get involved. And yeah, I'm really excited about the idea of women getting involved. Yeah. I mean, just the perspective. I love how you how you talk about the, uh, you know, the ability to multitask with empathy. (laughs) 
Yes. Um, <laughs> it's 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 amazing. So that's awesome. So tell us a little bit about when in terms of fostering deeper conversations. Have you found that as you get into the facilitation that um, you're able to uncover things that people wouldn't normally share or, oh, how, yeah. I mean, like how, how do you get to those through those layers, you know, and I'm sure there's methodology and obviously all of those things, but I think a lot of times we don't even do that with ourselves, right? We yes. tend to stop too soon and we don't even ask ourselves deeper questions. That's right. That's right. And, you know, one of the deep, the most profound things for me, actually, in my personal life was learning transcendental meditation got me deeper. You know, it gave me that, that grounding on that really universal level of humanity or something in a way that nothing else did. You know, it's, it's a really, so I think there are powerful individual tools that we can also use and develop. Oh, I love that you said meditation. That's fantastic. I mean, it's such a mindset, um, you know, process for us to get back into our own selves. Yes. So I love the fact that you brought up mindset. I think especially for African-Americans, it's it can it can take away some of the stress that's there of just being in this culture and and ground you again uh, in yourself, in, in who you really know yourself to be, you know. And there's a lot of research on this, too. Went to Washington D.C. with a friend of mine who's working who's working as a transcendental meditation teacher, and he's trying to get it into the schools because he feels like it's such a powerful mm. thing for for students. Yeah, so research also also shows it's it really helps students in their ability to thrive in school and stuff. So, oh wow, oh that would be awesome. Is there, you know that that's wonderful because I know and I think about even with the pandemic and you know the impact on the students during oh. that time oh. mm -hmm. um you know the the just the trauma associated yeah. not, not to mention all the other things that are going on with you know shooting in the schools and you know all yeah. i mean yeah. there's there's some real trauma that uh, you know when we talk about just feeling safe how do you even get to the safe space right um, right and and one of the uh, interesting things about uh, one dynamic facilitation session, they talked about um, what to do with a concentration camp. Mm. And this was a really loaded issue because the facilitator was told, don't touch this. This is too hot. Don't even touch it, you know. And in the course of it, one one of the women said, you know, I wish I'd been able to do more. And there was this incredible sense of empathy in the room as everyone felt the pain and the trauma of that whole thing. And the, the younger people said, you know, we don't feel like you've talked about this enough, you know. And the older people said, oh, we feel like we don't ever want to talk anymore about it. We talked about it enough, you know, enough. And it was kind of a realization that they hadn't really explored it in this way, on this deeper level. Mm. And now they could finally do something with this so there is, DF is really, dynamic facilitation is really a good technique, which was started by Jim Ruff in Washington State, by the way. And it's a really good technique for dealing with some of these traumatic things, too. And I think there's lots of, you know, there are other ways to do, deal with them, other techniques. I think appreciative inquiry is very good, holding a space for people to tell these stories. And those are the stories that are healing for us. And that's the way that we can heal is to hold a space for those stories and to see those different sides of it, how it was a difficult, you know, difficult time and stuff. Yeah. Well, and it's still a difficult time, unfortunately. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's a difficult time for us now too. And I think we have to hold space for us to come back together. And, and we need citizens to say, we don't want this anymore. We're tired of the divisiveness. We're tired of being polarized. We want to come together and take care of each other. And we want to create a future that is one that we want instead of being blind, we don't want. So we need to plan for the future. We need to create a civic agenda that plans for the future. And there's all these things that nobody's talking about enough. Like work as we know it is going to disappear. So we're going to need to talk about universal basic income or, or some of these things in order to be ready for these things. So we're not blindsided by them. Yes. 
there is, I mean, I love the fact that you're, you know, kind of thinking, you know, kind of taking us into this broad view of, I mean, things are changing so significantly that, you know, you probably, you you can't really even compare, like you'll be able to look back a hundred years and go, oh my gosh, this is so different. You know, we've got self-driving cars and, you know, all of these things that you maybe dreamt about, or some people did, you know, hundreds right. of years ago. <laughs> but but it's so interesting to me because you're right. There's so many different things, and we don't even know what the impact of those things will look like. But life as we know it will be absolutely different. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> In so many ways. I mean, my husband's a uh, computer programmer, and he's talking about the effects of AI, and it's just you know. Yes really have to be careful what happens with that it's you know it's possibly dangerous unless we really regulate it popular pop you know well and it, and it, it brings another point which is why you know dei becomes so significant because you know we talk about ai you talked about even the gi bill and it's like being adversely impacted on the gi bill african americans did not receive the type of legacy right. that a lot of whites received, right? So, you know, I think there's a level of consciousness that when, that I love when you talk about dynamic facilitation, bringing in those diverse views and going deeper allows people to understand or at least hear about the experiences in different situations. My lived experience is probably maybe different than yours, but you have a different lived experience probably than some of your friends. Yeah. When I, when I was writing my book, you know, I was like, I was just sort of casually said, yeah, I got arrested when I was 13. And they were, wow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it was kind of an eye opener to me because I felt bad that I, you know, was walked into the patio. <laughs> I was such a coward, you know. You so, wanted to be dragged in there, or what? I mean, I, like, I didn't want to get beaten up. I still don't like that experience. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Yeah, I can imagine watching Dick Gregory and you know, yeah. like what was happening. Oh my god! Right, right. but John Lewis, he was such a hero. You know, he, he. I mean, he was an amazing, such an amazing example of just the bravery that that took. Yes. Yes, absolutely. But that's how we learn, right? Um, Through those, through those uh, situations, unfortunate situations, in some cases, but they do serve as a learning opportunity for people to, to do better. And coming back to I, I definitely think we need reparations to make up for the social engineering that we did that disadvantaged African Americans. I mean, that just makes sense. It's not even a like, it's it's just a sensible thing to do. It doesn't it it doesn't matter like what your particular views are. It's the kind of investment that pays off. That's the thing. If we if people are going to school, and I mean I think we should get school down to a reasonable price. It's ridiculous that we've made education uh, an elite commodity at this point. You know? yeah. I mean, isn't it bad enough that we're giving them like this democ- wobbly democracy, a planet on life support, and then we're going to cripple them with debt? This makes no sense whatsoever. You know? yeah. We need to put wind in their sails to solve these problems and take away the debt. Absolutely. I love it. Well, and, you know, so many people think reparations are only about money. Um, right. But there's so many other aspects to, you know, even the acknowledgement, um, you know, the apology that I mean, there's so much healing yes. that goes into yeah. reparations. Thank you for bringing that up. I think there's um, definitely conversations and deeper conversations that need to continue to be had when it comes to reparations. So, yeah, and in, in Stockton, they they not only gave them money, but people volunteered to be a confidant to them and to talk to them on a regular basis. And that was as powerful as the money. You know, just having someone who can take you out of this stuck space. Right. And, and you're referencing the homelessness. Yeah, the homeless initiative. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And, you know, the other interesting thing was is the um, Harlem Zone, Children's Zone Project. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But they started with one block 
And they just started to talk to people and address the needs that they had on that one block. And then it grew from there, I think, to 37 blocks or something. And it was like just addressing people's needs, just going. And that's a big point I make in my book that there is a, a man named Marshall Rosenberg who discovered that he could stop conflict if he could understand the underlying need that was driving it. So he'd go to warring tribes around the world and he'd talk to them. And if he could get them to a point where they could say what they need and they each agreed to meet the other persons, the other groups, they could diffuse the conflict. So this idea of addressing needs is a really interesting thing. You know, like what is the need that different groups have to heal and to and to feel like they're part of the belonging in our country, you know? Yeah, well said. I mean, and, it, you know, I love I love what you're saying there, because I think um, there's so much that needs to go on when it comes to conversations and healing. Um, so I love the fact that you're digging deeper and and helping us to have these deeper conversations across racial lines or or anything else, you know, because I know there's a lot of disagreements on so many things. In the end, actually, is we have to have a spiritual renaissance where we revitalize our best values. Then, you know, we sort of lost any kind of sensibility of what's right and wrong. It's like we have pharma making money off our sicknesses, things that we just, just don't make any sense. These are not the kind of values that we should have. These kind of greed is just rampant and stuff. And so, you know, I'd love to he hear your thoughts about some of the values from Kwanzaa, too. Oh, my gosh. You're asking me about Kwanzaa. I love it. <laughs> well, and you know what's so interesting to me? One of the reasons I got so into Kwanzaa is because of the principles that it, you know, creates. You know, the fact that we're talking about unity and self-determination, collective work and responsibility, uh, self-determination, Look, I'm going to try to re remember all of them in a row. Cooperative economics, purpose, faith. But all of the principles that come up when you talk about Kwanzaa are really about making sure that we are taking ownership as a people. Um, you know, Kwanzaa being created for African-Americans in the United States part of the civil rights movement but it was really about how do you take, and, and I view it myself as being able to take a lot of the anger that comes with all the trauma, discrimination, the belittling, and making sure that we have values as a people to move through the system with all of the trauma uh, that we were going, that we continue to go through, really. I mean, it's a continued yeah. trauma. And so leaving the world a better place than when we left it, being able to name ourselves, you know, all of the things that we talk about when it comes to Kwanzaa in creating that level of unity, to me, anytime we can do it, and I've had Kwanzaa now in my house for, I don't know, like 23, 24 years, we do a big community event we literally bring the community into the house. And we've done other community Kwanzaa events where they're in bigger venues so that we can get more people. But there is some sort of difference when you are fellowshipping in someone's house versus at a, you know, some sort of right. institution. Right. And I think, you know, just being able to fellowship over a meal have that caramu feast and really focus on, you know, the principles, understanding the values. So you talk a lot about the values, but there's a lot of people in leadership where we are questioning their values. Yes. You know, we have to really help people understand what our values are and why we are important. We are valuable. We are, we make a difference. We have a purpose here. And so I think those are all, you know, we matter, you know, I'll yes. just say it yes. out loud, Black lives right. matter. Right, right. Um, and it's not that nobody else's lives matter. It's that we 
want to make sure people acknowledge the fact that we matter. So Kwanzaa to me was such a wonderful representation of highlighting some of those principles that you can take with you every single day. When you're thinking, when I'm thinking about, you know, how my day is going, how intentional I can be when it comes to unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics. Am I, are there African-American businesses that I can reach out to? You know, do I have faith in my teachers? Um, And that's throughout your whole life, not just while you're in school. I continue to have teachers, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so, you know, I appreciate a lot of the work that you're doing because I think we do need to have deeper conversations. And I think, you know, Kwanzaa is one of those things where I get to see people I haven't seen maybe in a year, but I get to renew those friendships and, you know, check in on people and see how they're doing and actually see them face to face in a lot of cases. Um, Yeah. Celebrating that harvest. That's great. And I think, I think those, those kind of deep ancient, some of those deep ancient values have to come up. You know, I, I was listening to an interesting uh, video, of uh, a native American talking about how that we need to rethink our relationship to the earth and instead of being the center of it, we need to be like the guardian of it stuff. I mean, that's, and that's a long journey from where we are, but it's, this is the kind of journey that we need to make into these new values to really understand our place in the world more appropriately. I mean, I'm, we're only guests on this planet, really. (laughs) Yeah. We should leave it in, in a better shape than we found it when we came. Absolutely. Well, and I think that's, you know, as we even, go into like what Native American land are, am I, is my house on? I mean, I did research oh, to try to understand that. Yeah. And, and then I found all of these other amazingly negative things that they did to the Native Americans in the state of California not that long ago. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. that I did not know about. I mean, you know, I knew we continue to fight about water here in the valley. Mm -hmm. And you start to really uncover all the history that's associated with water rights and land and, you know, all of those things. So it's really incredible what we're finding out now just by having conversations and people being able to speak up and talk about these stories that they've, you know, uh, that, that are finally coming out, realizing that you got one version of history. Right. There's so much more to it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I went to Budapest and they had these little um, shoes of, of children that had been uh, killed in the Holocaust. Mm. And, and you realize that when a country comes to terms with its past, something really big and healing happens. And I think that's what we have to keep in mind, that when we really come to terms with our past, There'll be this huge leap forward for us, I think. That's phenomenal. So before you go, please tell us how we can get access to your book and facilitation and, and all of those things. So give us the lowdown. So my book is available on Amazon and you can get it in Kindle or you can get it in um, a book form, whichever whichever way you like to read. <laughs> hardback paperback you know yes it's also hardback and paperback and uh, awesome. and i'm coming to california so i'm going to give you bring you yours <laughs> oh awesome well i ordered it but i'll take one from you sign okay that's right i'll <laughs> give you one sign too <laughs> you can give your other one away <laughs> awesome awesome yes i can't wait till you get here so i'm looking forward to uh to coming by and and checking it out yeah, so I'll be there on the twenty, the second week, and I'm going to try and do something the second weekend there in May. Okay, so if you're in Fantastic. town, let's definitely get together and talk. Absolutely, I yeah. I look forward to it. Wonderful. Well, thank okay. you so much for for being here. Any last words you want to leave us with? Yes, I want everyone to think that they can make a difference. Even a little fifteen year old girl and was able to start this huge 
climate movement, Greta Thornburg. And she's an unlikely candidate because she had Asperger's, says that's really one of her superpowers. So you don't have to have any particular personality or be any kind of person. You could just start with whatever you're really good at there to make a difference. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruth Backstrom. Um, get her book, Igniting a Bold New Democracy, Empowering Citizens Through Game-Changing Reforms. And so, thank you so uh, much, Melissa, for having me. It's really been fun to talk to you. I'm looking yes. forward to more. Thank you. I can't wait to see you in person. Yeah, me too. Thanks for joining me on the Jolly Podcast. Please subscribe so you won't miss an episode. See you next week.